everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Black and Blue Podcast. My name is Chris Swanson. I am Ken Wadi K from the Free Hugs Project. And um, we, we are, are neither are. East Coast or West Coast studio. No, we are. We're in the West Coast studio. Just but not we're our in Burbank, West man. Coast yeah, yeah. Like we took LA. a step up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we still got the black and blue theme going on here. Yep. Though, so that's pretty cool. Now, Ken's a little under the weather because he was supposed to be at a dentist appointment. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. I can't say what he was supposed to have, but it was something in the grill. Yeah. So, you know, for hip violations, I don't want to press you, but you were saying that your dentist is probably mad at you because you for had sure. to cancel. For sure. So yeah. I say just have him watch the podcast and he'll be all refreshed. Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> because who's going to fill in the hour of an appointment? Oh, come on, man. Just blame it on yeah. COVID. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, well, that makes it worse because I'm trying to fit people in for appointments. I get it. You know, I, I try to be a nice um client patron of people's services especially when you're working on my grill my teeth well, have to well, let me nice. just say anybody who's out there right now that has anything to do with getting dental work is cringing when they hear about what you have to go to the dentist for and yeah. and my son actually is going into dentistry and oh, really? yeah he does a great job but i mean good maybe, for him maybe he can hook me up with some free services so that i'm not paying a fortune for my teeth i got you nice. man i okay, got you right, exactly good, good. i mean he'll do it for free now he's just not a dentist you can <laughs> get it not, for nothing i'm not taking that shit so we have a great guest today gabby trejo and uh everybody always thinks oh my gosh she's related to danny oh yes and no uh because of the heritage and, and incidentally gabby before we uh go into your uh, introduction. I actually worked on a film with Danny Trejo about three years ago, and he is a legend. I didn't meet him because we filmed different days, but uh, he is a total gentleman. And uh, I know there's no relation, but I just wanted to give you my Trejo uh, introduction. So tell us who you are, Gabby. Tell the world that you are here to uh, share a message, and then we're going to get right into it. To Mr. Danny Trejo, I'm sorry. I apologize in advance because sometimes I do, when people ask him, like, Actually, yeah, that's my Tio. And like, really? I'm like, no. Tio is uncle. And like my cousin, you know? Like, yeah. Is Tio uncle or cousin? Uncle. Oh, yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah. I thought. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah. All right. He's my, he's, my, he's my uncle. We're related somewhere down the line, you know? And whenever I get scared, I try to channel my, like, Danny Trejo look, just very intense. And <laughs> Machete look? Ah! Yeah. Well, wait, is he? There's, okay, there's a certain actor that I have in mind. I don't know. Yeah, he's Machete. Name. Machete, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, they always and they always make him play like the a gangster. gangster. Yes. Yeah, that's, oh, okay. That would be awesome yeah. if that was your Theo. Because the be long like, hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the yeah. total image of like the gangster on on a lot of. I, I've got to remember a movie that I saw where he was in it, where I was like, I wouldn't want to be like late at night crossing the street. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he has that look, right? Okay. He does. That's all right. But that's not Gabby's look. If uh, no, no, you can no. see right now, Gabby no. is uh, a total professional <laughs> yes. that's uh, living in Sacramento trying to change the world. So we brought you on the show because what we're doing here in Black and Blue and the Us United movement is very similar to what you're doing and uh, the organization that you're a part of and the fact you're bringing people together that are unlikely partners for a great cause. So give us an overview of what you're doing in Sacramento, California and, and how that you think can roll into what we're doing and make a, a global movement. Yeah, thank you. Well, before I, I, I share, I want to start by saying that I see the world through the lens of my identity as, as a Latina woman and immigrant. So that really like shapes how I see the world and how I want to change the world and, and my purpose for why I want to change the world. So at Sacramento Act, we are a faith-based organizing network. We work with different denominations um, that are working together to really um, take people from this individual relationship with God to like taking action and being active participants in their communities with others. And so we're part of a, a statewide uh, called Pico California International who is based in action national. So there are people across the country and across California who are getting together and creating spaces of belonging um, that allows us to, one of the things that we believe at the core of who we are is that people closest to the pain have the solutions to their problems. Mm, yeah. So if we're to find solutions to systemic problems, we need to bring people together, and that's what we do. So you say some things, because Ken and I love the relationship we have. We talk about uh, issues that other people want to know about. In, in a very uh, conversational way. So before we get into the actual movement, you bring up some interesting 
perspectives. You're an immigrant from where? From Mexico. And when did you come over here? So I'm the oldest. Uh, my mom had me at 15. So oh. when I, when my mom turned 17, she moved to the U.S., got married, had kids. And at the age of 10, she sent for me. So when I think about unaccompanied minors, like I was an unaccompanied minor yeah. when I was 10 years old. And I was reunited with my mom in Escondido, wow. California. Wow. So, um, Were you scared? Do you I remember that journey? Say, I remember it very clearly. I remember um, my grandma telling me, you know, um, you are going to go get reunited with your mom. I remember what I was wearing. I had a little bag and I just, you know. But I where did she drop you off at? Where did she take you? Somebody came to pick me up at the house. Okay. Somebody came to pick me up and then we just, uh, you know, they said, you just stay quiet. You're going to, we're going to cross the border. And I crossed the border. Wow. And, and when I got to the U.S., so my grandma, I remember thinking, I grew up in Tijuana, which is the border town. And from my grandma's house, you can see the San Diego border. I always knew I was going to end up on this side of the border. I just didn't know what, when. My grandpa, uh, who just became a U.S. citizen last Thursday mm, at 83 amen. years old. How old? Um, he, 83. Nice. 83. Yeah. So it was a great way to celebrate 4th of July yeah. for our family. Wow. And um, he came, he worked, he has worked in this country since he was 13 during the Bracero program because he lied about his age. Mm. And so I knew I was going to end up here. And But I pictured the U.S. to be like Disneyland. <laughs> and then I got reunited with my mom and she was living in a one-bedroom apartment with her kids, her husband, another family and their kids in and, and it was in Escondido and yeah. that was not what I pictured. Right. I thought I was going to have my own room for the first time. No. Yeah. So I, I know this isn't the topic of the discussion, but I'd love to, to weigh in on it a little bit more because it is a current and pressing topic right now. Um, the idea of coming over as an unaccompanied minor. And I know there's a lot of talk around that right now and I often get into discussions with people where we have to uh, talk about how difficult it is some of the things that these families are escaping from over there to make it over here and like you said your idea of America was it it was like Disneyland because maybe there was suffering or things that you were seeing on that side of, of the border. And I say this because my parents, same thing, they immigrated here from Nigeria in 1979. And I know that there were things that they were running away from there with hopes of coming to America to start a life for their family. I couldn't imagine as a boy having to make that trip on my own to catch up to my parents. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more just about like, your mental space where you were as a 10 year old coming here to the United States um, and maybe conversations that you had with your mother as far as what your future can now become like as you're on this side as opposed to maybe what opportunities or lack thereof existed on yeah. that side. I'd love to know more about that. That's a great question. I just remember, I remember vividly. I, I, I mean, it's like I'm there. I remember being really scared um, because I didn't know these people that were taking me somewhere. Here, yeah. Uh -huh. And, but I remember being so excited because, um, you know, like I, as a child, I mean, I grew up with my grandparents who gave me lots of love, you know, and, and I'm very thankful for them and how they poured into me. Um, but I, in my head, it was like getting reunited with, with my mother was something that I always longed. Um, and my siblings who I didn't know really, right? Like, all of my siblings, I'm the oldest of six, they were all born in the U.S. And so um, so that was really, like, exciting. Of, like, I was going to be part of this, of my family, like, my tribe, right? Yeah. Um, and so there was, like, excitement. And I remember um, when, when I entered my mom's apartment, um, she had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich uh, at the table. And she was across from me. And she, I never had peanut butter and jelly. Like really? Wow. Ten -year -old, By 10 year old, no. 10 years old? Wow. No, that, we don't eat that in Mexico. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Who eats that? <laughs> but she, she pushed the plate to, towards me and said, you don't have to call me mom if you don't want to. Wow. wow. And, and then it was like, it, it dawned on me, like she was trying to be respectful 
uh, now uh, as an adult, I'm able, and, and after much healing, I was able to see that experience differently. But as a child, as a, as a 10 year old, I remember thinking like, wow, she doesn't want me to call her mom. Why though? Right? I don't I don't understand that. I, because I think she, um, my mom too was raised by her grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so she called her grandmother mom and I call mm -hmm. my grandmother mom. Yeah. And so it was like a way to, for her to really honor the fact that her mother had really raised me, even though she sent money and made sure that I was taking care of that I was going to school. And so um, I just remember kind of that excitement of the journey mm -hmm. and the long drive, which is like 30 minutes, 40 minutes from the border to my mom's house. And then like the disappointment of like facing a reality of like the place looks different. The, my mom saying like, you don't have to call me mom. And so it was very, um, yeah, it was like getting used to this new space, a new country, a new family. And so I'm, I'm good with change. All so the time. Gabby, like how long had you not great. seen your mom from the time you last saw her to the time you were reunited? Probably like, Eight years. Eight wow. years. And I mean, so you didn't have very much memory of her. And when did you become a United States citizen? I became a U.S. citizen during um, 2008 because I got to uh, vote during the the last Obama administration. Oh, cool! So. Wow, that's really cool. Yep. So the and other I am voting for me is like the most sacred act. I See? I will dress up. I want to be the first person in line. Wow. I have these my. Twin boys who are three years old, and they will go with me every time, anytime we vote. That's wow. good mothering Voting right there. That's really special. So, uh, do your boys eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? They do. Ah, there you Thank go. God they're not allergic. <laughs> they, thank God they're not allergic. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's, that's really cool. So, the other thing as far as culturally, uh, Ken and I talk, you know, he asks questions about the police world, and I ask questions about the black community. So, a question we have for you is, uh, you say Latino, but you come from Mexico. Is it offensive for people to call you Mexican or should they refer to people as Latino? Or what if somebody comes from Venezuela or Chile or, you know, someplace either, you know, Central America, South America? What is the Latino name cover and what should yeah. you not say well there's also a difference between latino and latina you have to remember that as yes well, right yeah. they, they, male female like latinx right yes yeah. Yeah. I, I i would say don't ever call somebody mexican that's the that's just like be safe because uh depending on where you are in the country latinos may look very different mm -hmm. right like we're black we can look asian we can look like anything yeah. um so i would just say i would just ask but to say latino it's um, or Latinx, it's Latino, all encompassing. Latina, it's safe. Yeah. Okay. It would be safe, but when somebody like when when I have long hair, people don't know. They people assume I'm Indian or Middle mm -hmm. Eastern, and so. Um, but I am comfortable. People call me Mexican because I am Mexican. I'm very proud of that, um, and I'm Mexican American. I I went through my rebel stage in college where I was like, you know, I don't want nothing to do with systems, and then I moved to Italy, <laughs> and in Italy it was. It was the first time as a 22 year old that somebody identified me as an American. And that felt foreign to me. I was like, I am not American, my Mexican passport. And they're mm -hmm. like, you're American. <laughs> and, and then I realized after a year of being in Italy, there, the only things I missed, there's three things I missed Dr. Pepper, ranch, and hot Cheetos. <laughs> None of the things that are Mexican. So I realized I have learned to really embrace my identity as nice. someone that is able to be bicultural and. And I love it. Yeah. It's, oh, I like that. Bicultural. <laughs> so let me just uh, ask one more question. You know, so I was, I've been in Honduras on a missions trip. So I refer to the people of Honduras as Hondurans, right? And that doesn't seem offensive. But it seems that when you refer people uh, from Mexico as Mexican, doesn't it have like this, this uh, little bit of a, a twang to it? Like, wait a second. Why do you think the difference? Like even Chilean or... Um, you know, uh, other other Central or South American countries, when you say that, it just doesn't have that that almost offensive ring to it. Am I on that or am I what? Uh, I don't know. I mean, my the people I grew up with, my friends and family, I don't think we would be offended. But if you were, I mean, I think I would imagine that the people that do have to do with their um, their identity of wanting to be a considered American yeah. and or... 
And also had to do with a lot of our own internal, like, racial bias of what that means yep. and what that looks like. And the assumptions that people make. I mean, I've been in spaces, in professional spaces, where people are like, oh, you're so articulate. You know? It's like... What does that mean? Yeah. That yeah. mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and so I think because people are just hurt, you know? Um, and I have come to realize that uh, when it comes to, like, people's identities, it is, it is very, it's like, navigating this uh, landmine of... People get offended. And when people do get offended, as we talk about race and like people's identities, it's like, just apologize, you know? Like, give each other grace. See, the reason I'm asking these questions is because wouldn't you want somebody to come up to you and say, Gabby, what and how should I refer to you? I mean, that's the most least offensive thing you can do to somebody, which is what we're trying to do to say, listen, if you don't know something about yeah. somebody, go ask them. The worst thing is try to assume that you know what they want. And I've, yeah. to Ken and I have talked about it. I said, when do you refer to somebody as a black male or an African-American? He goes, if you don't know me, I'm African-American. If you know me, I'm like, hey, that's, you know, what's up? I mean, you could say that because... You've got that relationship, you know, when and if yeah. in, 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 in the, our messages, if you see somebody that has a different culture or uh, a different background, just ask them in a not offensive way to say, hey, uh, can you teach me or can I ask you this? And I think people would be more apt to, uh, yeah, to respond sure. in a positive way. Absolutely. Yeah, because I think that recognizes that you see them yep. in their full self and you want to like respect how they want to be referred to and identified. I think that is what creates the space of people feeling, moving from this othering to belonging to mm -hmm. each other, right? And yeah. and um, and it, because it is so easy, we live in a, such a polarizing com society right now that it is easy to make assumptions about like, well, I see your shirt as a sheriff, maybe I shouldn't say certain things versus, you know, um, like, oh, like, where did you get that shirt? It yep. could be that simple, right? Yep. Um, Especially if you had a bad experience with somebody in the police department or the sheriff's office. I mean, you immediately, uh, you lump people into that same category, which is, again, why Black and Blue talks about issues that many people don't because we do it in a respectful way. Yeah. When we were talking pre-show, you mentioned the Chico community. Yeah. Explain that to us. Yeah, so, I mean, I, Escondido, where I grew up, uh, it's a prime, I mean, it's dominantly the Latino community. Um, and so, in my school, everybody looked like me, talked like me, Spanish was the normal. And then um, I went away for college uh, to Chico State, and um, it was very difficult. It's a very white community. It's all hippies um, up there I was in, in Chico. Very, a lot of hippies, yeah. yes. <laughs> but it's a wonderful community. It's like very rural. So even though I came from Mexico, I did not grow up in rural community. Like I lived in a city. And so people have assumptions about like my experience was in, in my experience in San Diego was a city, not a rural community. So when I came to Chico, it was like such a culture shock to realize there was. I remember when I called my mom once I moved into the door and so I was like, mom, there's so many trees here mm. because they're, it's beautiful. I mean, Chico is such a beautiful town. And, um, and, you know, has been such a huge part of my journey as a professional and um, hmm. as a woman. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I almost went to college at, uh, at Chico State, and I, I opted not to because I went and met the cross-country team, and it was a whole bunch <laughs> of long-haired, hippie white boys. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know that I feel comfortable here. Like, they, they've got their thing going. And uh I yep. ended up going to Cal State San Marcos, which is right near where you ah, were in Escondido. That's my neighbor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Chico would have been would have been fun just to get me away from the city, but I'm a city boy, you know, and so it would have been great hanging out with a bunch of hippie kids on the cross country team. But I get it, culture shock for sure. Culture shock. Talk uh, about it. My teacher Rachel Brownwin, who is my I call her my white mom. She um, was like talking to me about college. Um, no one in my family uh, had ever graduated elementary, yeah. get middle school or high school. So my mom was happy with me just graduating high school. And my teacher was like, no, you need to go to school. So she really coached me and, and took me under mm -hmm. her wing. And when she helped me move into the dorm and this lady has blonde hair, blue eyes. And I remember when they gave me the keys to the dorm and they're like, oh, is she your mom? And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> right. Look at the difference. Um, right. Look at the difference. But yeah. she, like, warned me about it. She's like, you're going to meet people. 
nobody, very, very few people are going to look like you. Yeah. And there's going to be people that have a lot of money and people that may not have a lot of money but want to pretend like they do. Don't spend more than you have. Yeah. And, and it was just like grounding me in like who I was and why I was there. Yeah. And so Chico State has been a very transformative moment in my life because it was the first time that I experienced very blunt racism totally. towards me as a person yeah. by students, by um, Faculty, other businesses yeah. in the community. I bet. Yeah. Hmm. And um, so I've learned to navigate that and I feel very comfortable yeah, I'm willing to bet, though, that assumption. people assume that she was your mom because not of how she looked, but how she treated you. So yep. that, that just yep. goes to show that uh, how you treat people actually sends a greater message than how you look. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it says That's a lot about right. allyship, too. When we talk about allyship, just people from different cultural backgrounds looking out for others. You know, I had a coach like that, my coach Johnson from high school, who has become like a father figure in my life. He's like a giant white dude, you know, and people wouldn't expect that, that like who I as a man still regard as yep. a father in my life, that he's this big white dude who at first he and I we didn't even get along when I first got there hmm. to the track team and then over time he started to explain to me that I was hardest on you because I knew your potential and I viewed you as a son and not someone who I was just coaching and and so it sounds like you had a similar experience like that with your quote-unquote white mom and and I think that's necessary you know sometimes people see those sort of things as why does race have to be an issue? Well, it is. It, it always is. But as long as we, we treat it in such a way that brings us together rather than um, divides us. You know, I, I love um, uh, there was a statement that you made a little while ago, um, seeing people in their full self, you know, seeing them. In, because I think often w we have people that say, I'm not racist. I don't see color. And it's like, well, actually, we would hope that you see color. We would hope that you see people in their full self and recognize it. That is a black man. That is a white person. That is a Latino person. And there's cultural differences there that I can learn from or benefit from by seeing them in their true self and their color rather than saying, I'm just going to disregard the color of the city. Well, if you do that, then you disregard everything that comes with their culture. You know, so I, yep. I think that's that's really cool. And that's a that's a neat statement that you made about seeing people in their full self. Did all your background and journey uh, play a role into what you do now? Because your priority now is developing people, underprivileged people that are forgotten. And now in your current role, you have decided to take all different faiths, right? Uh, not just one particular faith, I'm, at, I'm assuming, correct? Yep. And you yep. bring the faith-based community. Uh, it could be a Jewish church. It could be a Catholic church. It could be a mosque. It could be a Baptist church. You bring them together because the church base is built on taking care of people, no matter what faith, right? You bring okay. them together. How does that impact the underprivileged people that you serve yeah, that's uh, yeah, bringing people together. I mean, it's natural, right? We can't create these big um, system change just by bringing the people that you get along with. <laughs> that is the, that's not the that's not going to create the kind of power we need, like people power. Um, so it's like working with the different denominations to really look at what does our faith say, right? What does your 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 faith say about justice? And how does it look like? So taking Pope Francis, who's my personal idol as, as a Catholic woman, he um, talked about bringing people outside of the church doors, right? And so it's like really getting folks to go from the abstract of what they think uh, justice looks like to the concrete mm -hmm. and going out there, engaging people in the pews, hearing from them hmm. versus me uh, being a director and being like, you all should care about homelessness. Well, they might just care about mental health. So what we do in community organizing is that we engage people at the very local level and ask questions around what's keeping you up at night and move it from this very individualistic pain to a collective pain and say, if people closest to the pain have a solution to their problem, then you need to come to this table to be co-creators about what the future of our region needs to look like. So in the concrete, what these congregations working together have been able to accomplish is we were able to bring health care coverage for undocumented adults in our community. We've been able to 
um, increase funding for some of the uh, the schools at the very local level. We've been able to um, just do amazing things. And even like we created a table with uh, where clergy, law enforcement, and community activists are coming together to say, okay, something is wrong. How do we move forward, right? And how do we cre come up with solutions? And so looking at like, do, do law, does law enforcement have to be responding to mental health calls? And if the answer is no, like who are the partners that are already doing wonderful work that should be positioned to help support in those kind of calls? And so we really, um, I think that the faith community is instrumental in bringing, bringing together people and in creating the space and using their own institutional power to create system change. So, and that is, it, it sounds difficult, but actually it's, it's not. It's getting, it's very basic. Building relationship with one another so that you actually see people and act together. Yeah. Give us a specific example of a particular church you're working with for a particular purpose to serve this particular person. So specifically, so people can bite into it. What does it look like? So, um, so at the state, so we had one at the state had one um, brought driver licenses for undocumented adults, right? Back in 2013. But at the very local level, this woman, Gloria, who is part of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Catholic Church here, was like, Gabby, you, we, I'm so happy that now we get driver's licenses. She's undocumented. And she was like, but how come I get, when I submitted my application, I could write that I, I can be an organ donor, but I don't have health care coverage. And she was naming this very true contradiction. So I was like, that's a great question, Gloria. We should work on that. And so we, were, we, we engaged that church in particular to say, well, you know, how do they feel about health care? Where were they? And, um, and we started having conversations with the county and said, what would it take for Sacramento County to um, bring about this resource? And, and, and did a lot of research around how much money it would take. So it's actually very, um, very intense process to figure out what will it take to make this dream come true and who are the other people um, that are also impacted by this. Because it wasn't about Gloria, even though Gloria brought it up. Mm. It's about the fact that there's a whole community that has been left out of providing a very basic healthcare service. So that's one example. Okay, can I bust in real quick? We're gonna do a little sidebar. I'm not from California. I live in the Midwest. What, when you say undocumented, what does that mean when people hear undocumented and then they hear illegal and then they hear, what do those terms mean? Help explain that. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Um, so, well, illegal is just a very racist and derogatory Offensive term, term for sure. to, uh, to refer to a person that doesn't have documentation to prove their status in this country. So that's really what it is. What people oftentimes don't understand is that in our country, we only let in a certain number of people from different parts of the world to be able to migrate to this country. So usually if you are from south of our border, um, there is a very, very small number. And so um, so anyway, so that's what it really means um, when we say undocumented immigrants, people that don't have a status but do pay taxes and contribute to the economy of this country. So um, when we think about essential workers, um, undocumented immigrants have been part of the essential worker mm -hmm. community because they have still continued to work through the pandemic. And, um, and so that's one of the, the, the ways that I think about it. I mean, doesn't and, that go all the way back to 1968 Cesar Chavez? I mean, it weren't, isn't that the, the, the same population of people that served a, a great purpose for the entire country? Yeah, I mean, Cesar Chavez, one of my personal heroes, too. I have many heroes, by the way. Uh, he, Ken's he my hero. For, work, for, workers, for workers' rights, and he worked, talk about unity, right? He worked with the Filipino community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a fight that was a collective fight that happened to be with, because it's California and a lot of our agricultural workers happened to be Latino um, and in his time Mexican 
um, he his fight was around wages and workers' rights, and it did encompass um, you know undocumented immigrants in that fight. So, so you take on specific yeah, undocumented challenges. Undocumented immigrants is the right. Good. See, yes, absolutely. Uh, you're taking on a lot of uh, personal uh, challenges for people, but it also can spill over to beyond Sacramento. You mentioned you have a sister chapter in LA, right? Yep. And yep. um, in LA, LA, San Diego, um, Bakersfield, throughout the whole Central Valley, the Bay Area, um, and we're working on issues from housing. Housing is a huge issue that is happening um, across our state and across the country people that are like really hurting and we're like literally bleeding people out of their own communities where they were raised, born and raised. And so we are um, working across the country to figure out uh, how do we address the issue of housing in a way that we're looking at it through a lens of equity and systems change. Um, and so um, housing, education, some folks work around climate justice, so different issues. The the folks in the churches in the congregations, um, once we do listening, they decide the issue they want to work on. How how large is the organization? So we have been in Sacramento for thirty years, and we have about fifty six member congregations. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, so when you say fifty six member, you're talking fifty six different congregations, not just fifty six people. That's right. And explain what. No, the, not fifty six. Yeah. Not fifty six. What? people yeah. that's how big it is yes yeah. Yeah. and name yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, name yeah. some of the churches some of the faiths that uh, are huge supporters of, of this social justice uh, well definitely um, we're very like a heavy number of our folks are Christian so different Christian denominations Catholic Baptist evangelical um, we have the Jewish community that in Sacramento they were the first ones um, in 2017 who opened their synagogue to be sanctuaries for undocumented immigrants that were in you know um in, in threat of being deported um and then we have um, the muslim community that's very active and engaged um and then um other folks that consider themselves spiritual but are not attached to other um to a particular institution wow 56 institutions yeah. really cool. are there other states doing what you're doing besides california yeah, um, through our uh, Faith and Action National, we are in um, Florida, Washington, New York, Arizona, um, Texas, Colorado. I mean, we are across the country, Hawaii, right? Um, and we take this very big concepts around, like, like I said, abstract issues and, and work with people to make them be like eating a pie, like just a slice at a time. And so looking at what does the community need and want at the very local level. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're across, across the country. And really, it's not even about the issues. It's about development, the development of people, like their leadership. Can right. we take people from, from just thinking that um, their self-interest is, more important than anything else hmm. to like my self-interest actually can also be linked to other people's self-interest in a in a community sense and so um we really invite people to be active participants and protagonists of what the future can look like so one of the things i took note of is uh you had set off line uh, when people struggle uh, that's the time where people need to step up but i've always thought when you personally are struggling with something, go help somebody else that's struggling and you'll both be served. And that is health-wise, that is financially. Um, if we wait for us to have perfect timing and everything in line yeah, in order to take down. action, nothing gets done. Yeah. And uh, you know, some of the topics we talked about are hard topics that are a national conversation, but you, know, you mentioned other states that have nothing to do with border states. I mean, you're talking right. Washington, Colorado, you're talking about places where it's simply helping people while we fix the overall issue, there are still human beings that need to be cared for. You, you cannot forget about lives in 10 year old little girls that are experiencing peanut butter and jelly for the very first time. And I think that's the human side. You know, a lot of us work with organizations. A lot of us uh, maybe are heavily more involved like I am with government at the, at the county level. 
But if I ever forget that what I do impacts a human being, then I have lost the focus of my job serving people. Yeah. When, um, when you talk about this to other churches, law enforcement, do you get resistance? Um, law enforcement or community? Anybody. Where, where, does, where do you your do? critics come from? Uh, I would say both sides, to be honest, because uh, for some people, they believe that um, we as the faith communities don't have a voice in talking about system change, which I personally disagree. I think it's uh, being an uh, active participant and taking public risk is important for institutions like the faith community. They have a unique voice mm-hmm. um, and, and a unique contribution to bringing people together. Um, and then with law enforcement, when we sit down with them, you know, I, I would say that they always, um, it, it is like the conversation around defunding police, right? Like when, when, when organizations talk about that, it becomes very, very triggering. Yeah. But when we meet with the chief or we meet with the sheriff um, here at the, uh, uh, in our community, we build a relationship with them where we are able to say, we want, our people want to see more investment around mental health. Our community, actually, our community wants to have a better relationship. They don't want to. They don't want to like um, be afraid for their lives when they're calling for help or mm-hmm. when they're walking down the street. And so, how do we create the safety? So, I would say our our critics come from both because we're never. Uh, for some people, we may not be too radical for them, and for others, it's like you're trying to ask for us to like to do without us. And we're like we're talking about reimagining. How do we both? How do both sides come together and imagine what the future is? Because it's about people, right? It's about like how, it can be the the difference between someone being alive and someone not being alive. And and our clergy, I must say that our faith leaders, law enforcement, always calls them because they know <laughs> that Pastor Les Simmons here in Sacramento can talk to that family Absolutely. and be and be a partner yep. in this, right? And so um, that's smart policing right there. Was, yeah, and, and 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 the reality is that our folks want to see everybody be safe, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes that um, sometimes that can happen, and sometimes it doesn't happen. But in my experience, the only way that we have been able to create real change in Sacramento, or when we have made you know steps towards change, um, it has been when we build a deep relationship with folks that may have a different view mm-hmm. of what. It means to invest in communities. So um, I, I got to share something with you. When the pandemic hit the whole country uh, in March of last year, um, our social services in Flint, which is a uh, highly populated uh, area, concentrated, but also the out county, these guys know it all too well. The bottom line is people that were getting diapers delivered and formula for single moms and single dads, not everybody's just single mom, uh, yeah. but also the elderly, people that are homebound, they, they immediately stopped within 24 hours because those workers weren't coming to work or they were sick. And as the sheriff, I'm also the emergency manager for the county. And I'm thinking, all right, like, you know, all these things were coming about. I'm like, this makes sense. So I sent a, an email out to over 400 churches. And uh, we said, meet here at the county on March 17th. And I have a, an opportunity. We had over 40 churches show up, 40 different pastors, and I deputized them as deputy sheriffs for 90 days, like, like they did in the Old West you know, with the marshals. And I said, you are going to now deploy the congregation to go serve the people. And in those 90 days, we delivered a million pounds of solid food, 700,000 pounds into the city of Flint. We had people taking water every single day and because we had a water crisis in 2016. They were still distrust that. And, you know, food and the diapers and the formula, and, and we had uni leaders involved. And you are so right, Gabby, because right next to those pastors and preachers and, and priests and all those people were law enforcement working together, driving trucks, driving sheriff cars, and the people had a sense of trust. And so I would encourage any law enforcement out there, I don't care what your personal faith is. I'm a Christian too. I'm a believer. Ken's a believer. But I will work with anybody. I was at a, a Yemeni's Muslim wedding for four hours on Saturday night. You know, I love the Muslim community. I love my Jewish friends. I love my Catholic friends. Don't let your personal conviction stop you from using the power of the church. Yeah. And you see that firsthand. So every community has church. There's more churches than our police departments in any community. <laughs> Take advantage of the church. Knock on the door. Introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah. That's important. Very 
I remember um, when it's like uh, when we do justice work, it is sometimes people get confused because they're like, well, do you go around? If, my mom, for example, is like evangelizing people. And I'm like, well, no, I, I don't do that. I, I don't talk scripture. Like, I, I'm just a regular person. But my job is to train people to better understand um, what is power? How do we use? How do we build collective power? How do we create systems yeah. change? And um, and then the the clergy are the ones that are doing the real hard work of, you know, um, helping people understand how their faith is mm-hmm. is tied to this this calling for justice. In Sacramento, we the county, you know, pulled together our faith leaders across and and some of the stuff that they've been doing. It's beautiful. After service, we've had. Um, an AME church, like the pastor is 90 years old hmm. and um, she still talks about masks. She was making masks because she couldn't come out of her house and, you know, just was just sending it to everybody. Yep. I mean, um, it is, it is important to, to realize that regardless of whether people believe in an, in, in the, in the institution yep. of the faith, um, that um, at the core of who we are is um, we see each other as children of God, and if we are if we are true to seeing each other and the God in each other, then um, then then the work kind of flows on itself. See, I and Ken and I have talked about this. We have no shame, or I'm not embarrassed to say I'm a Christian, and and uh, and, and and my Muslim friends, my atheist friends, my agnostic friends know where I stand, because I, I think if people respect each other, that's one thing. But the second thing is. You know, I say, you know, obviously the Bible in, in my faith teaches that when you do for the least of these, you do for me. So you take care of people that are locked up. You take care of people that are hungry and people that are thirsty and people that are homeless. That's the basis of what, what Jesus did while he was here. And I'm okay to say that. And that doesn't repel people from me. That that shows people like, oh, that makes sense. Because so many times yeah, we have had people in different organizations that have taken that and, and maybe shown a negative light on that. So uh, to, to your mom who asked that question, I think our actions evangelize more than our words ever will. That's right. yeah, I think it's the best way to demonstrate our faith. It's all through through actions. You know, if we're going around just saying, hey, I'm Christian. Hey, you know, I'm a man of faith. Hey, you know, I'm a man of God. It's like, ah, I'm over it, right? Do the work. <laughs> yeah. Do the work. That's I right. got a buddy of mine who says, that if he ever sees the fish advertised on a business, he will never do business with really? them. Really? Yeah. Because he says, I have been taking advantage of see? more than anybody. Yeah, from them. Yeah, you're, from you're, the fish yeah, people. You're, like, yeah. You're showing it off. It's like, just do the just work. Just do it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, totally. so, so, yeah and I, I would I would take it a little step further, uh, Chris, because I think it's like, yeah, like we, how do we like serve others, right? Like people yep. that are in prison or like the homeless, right? Like how do we feed them and do that? The, the very direct, service that needs to happen but then as people of faith how do we ask this deeper question around what is causing this for happening in our community right like what's causing so many people to be like on the street what is causing the mass incarceration in our Mm. country and then we start getting to the bigger question of you know like solutions Mm. right but it is um i i 100 percent when i think as a catholic myself i i think about who Jesus is, and I just picture Jesus being like on the street and the front lines, right? Yep. Um, yeah. Giving free hugs yeah. to people who might be looking at you, like, "What? Why do you? Why do you want to give me a hug?" Right? Totally. Like, but that that we um, the the when I think of, of Jesus in, in my in my context, it's a very act. He's a very yeah. active participant that's hanging out at the you know um, with prostitutes, prostitutes and, and tax collectors and drunks. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I mean, even even though society tries to tell us that he had the image of those hippies up in Chico, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think right. he was just a regular person like all the rest of us, and he just he cared about the least of people and wanted to make sure that they were loved and and accepted. and And I think that's that's in all of us, you know. And we all should be capable of being able to reach out and love the people that are around us. And so the work that you're doing is is such an example of that. And especially when you're bringing people together of all different denominations, people of different faith backgrounds and saying, let's just do the work together. It's like that, that walks so much in line with what Christ's message was. And it was hardly a message. It was an example. Exactly. He set an example, you That's know, right. and, and all we have to do is just 
in being good people. Follow that example. Just take care of people. So, Gabby, we're about to wrap up. I'm going to close out with a question and a final thought, and then Ken's going to do his final thought and then end the show. So, first of all, how can someone find you, follow you, if they're interested in the work you do? Well, um, they can find us at um, sacsacact.org. Um, or if they're, in an, if they're in Sacramento or in the region or if they're in other parts of the state, they can go to picocalifornia.org. And they can maybe want to start a chapter in their state or their community. They can reach out to Gabby Trejo, right? Yeah, they can, if, they, if they reach out to me, then I can connect them to our, our statewide or, our, you know, our national to start those conversations. Because right most likely there is a chapter in your, in your community. Excellent. And then the final question that I have is, what are your personal thoughts of law enforcement, specifically sheriffs? Um, so thoughts are that uh, sheriffs are in my in my context here in Sacramento we had a big fight because our local sheriff I don't know if I like a, where this is going <laughs> our local sheriff had a, a, a contract with ICE with immigration uh-huh. services that brought seven million dollars so that's the relationship I have but um, I have friends and relatives who are sheriffs too and so and I know that they went into this field because they want to serve others Right. Um, and so my personal belief is that if if the local sheriff's department is willing to, to sit down with me and our leaders and our faith leaders, I will always have that door open because at the end of the day, I am called to make a difference in my community. And that will require law enforcement. And um, because it is part of my personal journey, someday God is going to ask me, where's your brother? And you are my brother. And I need to be able to answer that. Nice. And so I want to be able to, to serve others with people that have different views from me. Um, and so I would say that I have seen both the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I believe that um, we need to come up, come together yeah. more often than not. Yeah. Well, I tell you, the sheriff is, is the people's guardian. They're a trusted organization. The sheriff themselves uh, is trusted by the people. So there's a, a great responsibility on the shoulders of elected sheriffs to be exactly that, to look at the community and serve, protect, and unify. So uh, I appreciate that. And if you ever get to Flint, Michigan, I make a mean grilled peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Ew. Peanut butter is my favorite. I'm not grilled? kidding. Grilled? Grilled. You put a little, I'm telling you, man. Whole grain, whole wheat. No. With olive oil, nah. natural peanut butter that's creamy because you don't want those chunks in your teeth. Red nah, raspberry nah. with the seeds in there, grilled both sides. Yeah, Boom! I'm telling you. To you, cut you, cut diagonal. It? You got to cut it diagonal, it not halfy. I'm telling you, I'm making it next time we're doing the East Coast side. Yeah, I'm not eating it. You have to. Okay. It's, my culture. You. You it's my culture. It's my culture. Your, your culture is a grilled Police peanut culture. Butter. Get out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's, I haven't to Flint, Michigan during the water crisis. I was what there to organize? Latinos. Yeah, with Aurelia or uh, with uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe on Coldwater Road. And with Our Lady of Guadalupe. Boom! That's my backyard. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I was there, and I have. It was such a beautiful experience for me. Transformation as an organizer, and and cool. how um, we look at. Even when I got to Flint and I looked around the housing, I was like. I am not in California. Yeah. So talk, I mean, sure. talk about privilege, right? Like, even when yep. you think you don't have privilege, yes. you have layers and layers of privilege. So, That's exactly. So it's a tough city. So important. It's a yeah. tough city, but welcome. And if you ever come back, you've got to connect with me. You promise? Yes, I promise. All right. Ken, close this out, man. Um, well, I, I don't have any final thoughts. I was just uh, I was curious, as our, our first Latina guest, um, what is – something that you think our viewers should know about your culture, whether it's art, food, music, something that you're like, if people knew this, we think they should try it or experience it. Wow. And not his little whack, little grill. Come on, see, butter, judging. Yeah, like, that's just terrible. <laughs> something awesome that, they, that you can say, if you go and seek out this about our culture, you'll, you'll have a better understanding. What is that? Uh, I think that whenever you see the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mm -hmm. okay, regardless of whether you practice a faith, not all Mexican people are Catholic, obviously. You just want to make sure nobody thinks that. Mm -hmm. But the the, the symbolism of Our Lady of Guadalupe, I think, tells 
a lot about who we are as a Mexican community, both um, the motherly aspect of Our Lady of Guadalupe, yeah. but also a symbol of justice and in love. And so that is why for us, one of the things that's so important as a community is family, yeah. right? And it doesn't matter, like, my mom is crazy sometimes, but I love her to death. I, um, you know, and so family unity, it's important. And not unity in the, like, we get along, yeah. but unity in, in the sense of being able to still sit in tension. Yeah. Kind of like a rubber band and stretches so far, so far apart from each other but that we're still going to be together. Yeah. And so if any of, you know, like when we when I think about um, how much love we have for our family, that encompasses having 20 people live in one two bedroom <laughs> apartment. Yeah. And guess what? Like people make fun of that, but that is that if that is our version of affordable housing because we don't want our loved ones to be on the street. Yeah. And so we are I, I would say like uh, I I love uh, my community. I love my people and I think um the, the other part is that we are very happy people. Yeah. And I think it's because even in the midst of pain and suffering and feeling unseen or in the margin for whatever reason, um, we always find joy. Yeah. And I always, uh, I know that from my grandpa. And so when you see Our Lady of Guadalupe, just be reminded that she is a symbol for many of us of, of love, of compassion, and of, of family. Yeah. Strong family values. That's that's what I, I gathered from that, and and I think people should easily be able to see that just in in your culture. You know, you look at even some of the recent cartoons and, and movies that are out. There's the Disney, uh, what is it, Coco? I think it is. Coco, uh, the, yeah. yeah. The little boy with um, just uh, the Dio de los Muertos celebration, right? And and yeah. just the family traditions that come with that. Those are things that you really only see in the Latino culture. And, um, and, and I think that's something that people can learn from or appreciate because I could tell you a lot of other cultures in America, whether black or white, if you look at the way that we treat our elderly sometimes, it's like, hey, it's a little messed up. We're putting people in old homes or, you know, but your guys' culture is not like that. You really stay very mm -hmm. closely knit as, as a family, and I think people can benefit from that. So thank you Beautiful. For, for sharing that. Thanks, Gabby. We love you. We appreciate you. Thanks, my friend Ken. Yes. Awesome. And uh, this is Black and Blue. We'll see you on the next episode.